Hi, welcome to Medicine Matters Diabetes. I'm Jay Schubert, a diabetologist and family physician at Toro University of California. We're going to continue our series on hypertension in the elderly, an update from the American Diabetes Association from their position statement. I'm joined today by Dr. David Strain, MD, who is a clinical uh, senior lecturer in diabetes and vascular preventive medicine at the Institute of Biomedical and Clinical Sciences at the Peninsula Medical School in Exeter, UK. He's also the head of the academic department for healthcare in the elderly and the author of the UK 2017 guidelines for the management of diabetes in older adults. David, welcome to Medicine Matters Diabetes. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. We really enjoyed our earlier conversation talking about what's unique about hypertension in the elderly, but now I want to kind of get more into the nitty-gritty of what do we do to treat hypertension in the elderly with diabetes. So you highlighted earlier about isolated systolic hypertension, widened pulse pressure, but it's a real challenge for me to use medicines that don't drop both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Tell us a little bit more about your approach to this patient population. Well, one of the first things to consider is do we actually need to treat the patient at all? We have to remember that we are dealing with a population with a limited life expectancy. And we never like to admit that as physicians, but very often when we're dealing with 85 or 90 year olds, they're not going to live long enough to reap the benefits of our antihypertensive therapy. So that's one thing that we need to be cognizant of before we start to initiate therapy at all. Then when it comes down to the strategy, we need to look at the, the, the rest of the patient. What are the comorbidities? Our very elderly patients have usually got evidence of left ventricular dysfunction or at least diastolic dysfunction. It is usual for them to have some sort of renal impairment, if not full-blown chronic kidney disease. So we have to make these considerations before we choose the agent of choice. If we've made our decision that we're going to treat our patient, the next strategy is to find out which of those comorbidities we could potentially treat with additional therapy. So for example, um, I'm not a big fan of using alpha blockers per se for an antihypertensive. However, if you're treating a man with prostatism, uh, with BPH, you might be able to get two birds with one stone by using a low dose of doxazosin. We have the feeling that ACE inhibitors are of benefit to all of our patients with diabetes. However, we have to be aware that um, renal vascular disease is almost the norm in our very elderly patients. And we could trigger a profound renal impairment in an elderly patient that might have taken months or years to appear in a younger patient. So whereas in our younger patients that I'm treating with diabetes, I will routinely use an ACE inhibitor. For our older patients, I tend to avoid them. Salazide diuretics are a very well tolerated group of drugs in our older adults. Um, we have to be aware of the risk of hyponatremia and that is far more pronounced in our older adults than it is in the youngsters. And it will have quite significant impact on their quality of life. However, that only affects about 5 to 10% of our patients. And the reality is, thiazide diuretics will have excellent results. And they will also help treat the underlying, very mild um, left ventricular dysfunction that they're going to have. Yeah. When it comes to beta blockers, I'm not a fan of them for our older patients purely because the side effects tend to actually outweigh the benefit. And particularly in our older patients, it is most important to remember that we are trying to add quality to the remaining years rather than improve their life expectancy forever because our elderly patients don't want to live forever. They want to have the best quality of life that they can get within the time that they have left. You mentioned some really important points so about what medications to avoid in certain patients. You mentioned diuretics. So in di when we use diuretics, do you have a preferred diuretic? Do you have kind of a ceiling? You know, I, I often see that people use too little diuretic too, li too little often. Uh, I, I do agree with that. I mean, we use thiazide diuretics in the UK very frequently, and um, we see a lot of people who will stick at the minimum dose of them without actually triggering enough of a, a, an effect to, to get the benefit that we need in our patients. And so I will very top commonly go to a um, straight on to a high dose. Um, 
I think the risk of diuresis is well overstated and it only really becomes an issue if you start mix and matching with some of the other agents will also have a diuresis. So, for example, combining a thiazide with an SGLT2 inhibitor is not a great combination for an older adult. Whereas a simple thiazide on its own will do the job very, very well. And it's got a huge evidence base. And actually, we know in the all hat study, the thiazide arm did just as well as ACEs or calcium channel blockers. So there doesn't really seem to be any incentive to go for these other agents. You know, one of the things I see commonly is that people will start a diuretic or start an ACE or an ARB, and then there's no plan for any lab follow-up. And you, you've mentioned some really important things about renal function, which is a very common comorbidity. What guidelines do you have or recommendations do you have regarding mm -hmm. follow-up for lab testing after you start one of these agents? Well, we will normally, if we're starting an ACE inhibitor, I'd want to see the, the renal function test performed within two weeks. And I know that seems very soon but compared to how we treat it in a younger population. But within two weeks, we must have um, the renal function test because the kidneys don't have the ability to bounce back at the age of 80 that they did at the age of 45. Um, with the thiazide, again, renal function becomes important. Less so for the effect, impact on um, urea and the, um, the dehydration. And actually more prominently because of the risk of hyponatremia, which will have a profound effect on the quality of life of our older adults, even though it might not add to the, the comorbidity profile. And again, I would normally recommend this be done within two to three weeks of starting the agents. It's important to bear in mind that any concomitant disease on top of the ACE, ARB or thiazide diuretic will also have a separate impact on the kidneys. So it becomes important for um, comorbidities, and it could be a very simple comorbidity, a, a common viral illness that we may not worry about in a younger patient. That comorbidity should trigger a repeat of the renal function tests. And very often, I'll tell my patients if they're getting unwell, just omit those medications for a few days. Because the worst that can possibly happen is the blood pressure runs a bit high for a few days, and then when they're back to normal, everything will resume as before. Oh, that's a really important point. I think that that practical approach of being willing to withhold the medicine at times of crisis or illness is really a, an important thing that can reduce emergency room visits and hospitalizations. So I, I love that point. And, and with our older patients, we actually I, I document their drug lists. So we'll have a list of tablets that must never be omitted, such as the anticoagulation for those in atrial, atrial fibrillation or the antiplatelets for those with the coronary artery disease. But we also have a separate list of drugs that say if you're feeling unwell, if you've got a diarrheal illness, don't take these. Drugs like the metformin, the SGLT2s, and uh, the thiazide diuretics, and the, the ACE inhibitors. Beta okay. blockers are one interesting one on that because if we're treating a patient for heart failure with a beta blocker, Discontinuing that, even in the acute setting, can have a catastrophic rebound effect. Whereas if we're just treating hypertension with them, then actually they usually would benefit from having them reduced. So you have to bear that in mind when you're making these guidelines to patients. And, and great point. And you mentioned heart failure. So heart failure is also a concomitant problem in the elderly. Are there any special tricks you would utilize with the acknowledgement that don't overtreat, which I think is a great um, background and point? Yeah, I mean, the, the heart failure is very tricky in our elderly population because actually by the time the elderly heart starts failing, so too the pressure also starts to fall. So we don't have as much leeway as we have in a younger population to go in with the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the spironolactone, Entrestor, or any of these other new drugs. Our elderly patients can't take them because they don't have the physiological reserve. Very often we just end up treating them on a symptomatic basis to try and improve the quality of life for as long as they've got it. Um, maybe low dose loop diuretics in the morning and very often I'll use a, a nitrate, longer acting nitrates that traditionally associate with, um, with angina, but the same drug at six o'clock in the evening will provide nocturnal pulmonary relief and provide a good symptomatic improvement for those patients. We don't hesitate to use low-dose morphine as well for these patients that will help control the blood pressure and also control the symptoms. And interestingly, recent studies are suggesting that by reducing the adrenergic drive, 
it also slows the progression of the disease. I'm not saying that this becomes a, a new treatment for heart failure, but for those very extreme symptomatic elderly patients, this will provide a, a great additional benefit. Wow, so you've really raised some great points today. You talked about, remember the elderly have a limited life expectancy, let's not over-treat, let's make sure that we're doing treatments that improve not only the quality of their life, but quantity when it's relevant. You talked about being aware of renal disease and its effect on uh, medication choice. Make sure that we do monitoring after we start a thiazide diuretic or a renin acting agent. And then know that the uh, complexity of heart failure makes it even harder and we may have to think even outside of our typical antihypertension agents to really get the best of both. Um, really important points. We really appreciate your expertise and we're so glad you were here today on Medicine Matters Diabetes. It's been a pleasure, Jake. I look forward to speaking to you again.